on the phone so I can learn it. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, we'd like to get started. This is a little uh, earlier than yesterday. Our, uh, our crowd isn't quite here yet, but uh, we'll have people coming in. Um, uh, Jeff just suggested that I remind all the speakers to stand kind of close. Oh. Hello, hello, yes. Somewhat close. You start wandering away. Uh, we're recording this, and for the people that are on the phone as well, or maybe even the back, it's, it's very hard to hear. Same thing with the questions. Um, just, just wait till you have the microphone. I know some people have some very loud and booming voices, but they still, still aren't picked up by the microphone. So we, just for the benefit of those people that are um, on uh, calling in. Uh, also, let's see, just a reminder that if you signed up for coffee, please, by all means, have coffee. If you didn't, you can pay for it. Uh, there's, uh, the caterer is, is there to uh, take those uh, fees. Uh, let's see if there's any other announcements. Um, oh. Um, we need to get a head count for Franklin's, and so right before the break, I'll ask for hands of those people that did not sign up, um, but wanted to now, we'll uh, get that head count. Right now we have about 30 going to Franklin's. And if you have to not, not go, then also let us know that too after the fact. So we can just, uh, so Tammy can just give a head count to, uh, to Franklin's for tonight, so at 6.30. So we'll start with Stan Benjamin, who is our host. Uh, chair for this uh, first set of speakers from the regions, and I'll uh, give Stan the microphone. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, we have this pretty interesting session, even if sparsely attended so far, but it's going to be a great one with the uh, regions represented with their presentation, starting with Ken Johnson. We have 20 minutes total per talk here, and the intent is to have 12 per presentation and eight ish. So uh, it's my job to try to leave some kind of order and uh, obedience in that whole schedule. So thank you, Ken. Here you go, if you want it. All right, thank you, Stan, and thanks uh, for everybody here in the audience. Um, <coughs> the, uh, as was mentioned this morning, uh, the regions have a, a chunk of time to, to describe what the uh, modeling needs are for the uh, forecasters in the field. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, typically pool our time at these NSEP reviews uh, and uh, have a joint discussion and then follow up with questions and discussions. Uh, but that's traditionally what we've done. Uh, in other words, we didn't follow the agenda. Uh, but this time we're going to break with tradition and uh, stick with the script, and we're each going to give a uh, presentation about the, the needs in our particular regions. And, and uh, so uh, I'm going to start here by uh, talking about, it was mentioned yesterday that uh, it's been about 20 years that we've been having these reviews. Uh, uh, a lot of us have attended them right from the very beginning. And uh, also something else happened about 20 years ago, and that is a change of the forecast process within the uh, forecast offices. Uh, they went to producing gridded forecasts, and uh, that <clears throat> was a big change. Uh, first off, it meant that uh, rather than having to use uh, images of model output, uh, perhaps some of you remember the fax charts, uh, raise of hands of all those who have seen those, know what they are. Yeah, I expected Steve Weiss. I don't know where Jeff Domago is, but I expected at least those hands popping up. Uh, okay, Thermofax. Anyway, uh, what it meant was they were now getting real live model data in to work with, get their hands dirty with, to produce the forecast. And so it was support from the modelers here that uh, in part helped launch that shift in the forecast process. Now, another tool was made available to do the forecast process, and that was AWIPS. And for the purposes of our discussion here this morning, um, we can think of AWIPS as having two parts. One is the display and, and interrogation of the data part called D2D. The other part is forecast generation, uh, the, in particular the gridded forecast editor, GFE. And uh, so it was that combination of models and GFE that allowed the forecasters to start producing gridded, uh, gridded fields. Now, in the, 
interim time, or at least in the last few years or so, there's been an increased emphasis in the Weather Service for decision support, uh, what we call DSS. And I don't quite know where that feedback is coming from. So, uh, so DSS has come along, and that's put increased uh, emphasis on providing good, solid forecasts and warnings to our partners and users. The, uh, it's also, as they learn and understand what the Weather Service can provide, uh, it's meant an increase in information in terms of uh, spatial information as well as temporal information in, in terms of the forecast and warnings. Now that presents a particular challenge uh, when you're trying to produce gridded, uh, gridded forecasts. Um, and I'll, I'll get into a couple of challenges here that certainly isn't all inclusive and, and you'll see in, in the other region's presentations uh, similar challenges and, and some different challenges. But uh, one, one of the areas I'm going to uh, select here uh, in terms of having to produce uh, gridded information of increased spatial and temporal resolution is the role of the boundary layer in trying to do that, boundary layer information. The uh, information uh, in the form of temperature, moisture, winds uh, are all important for the a whole range of, uh, of, of uh, forecast needs, uh, ranging from convection and, and forecast and convection to snow cover and everything in between. There's aviation weather, uh, there's fire weather, marine, uh, in, in the form of fog and ceilings and visibilities, road weather, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, boundary layer issues are in, in important and having boundary layer information uh, is important uh, to the forecasters. Another thing that's important for DSS uh, is becoming more so anyway, is trying to provide uncertainty information. How, how good are our forecasts? How, how, uh, uh, what, what do we know about the, the errors in the forecast the, uh, and the uh, cer certainty in the forecast? So these, these are some of the, the challenges uh, in getting uh, numerical support to support the generation of the uh, forecast and warnings in order to support and increase the uh, demand with DSS information. So, um, has, uh, has the model suite, the production suite, met the needs? I, I've got no here. That's a little strong. Uh, there, there has been improvements in, in the models uh, uh, from the HER to the G, uh, GFS uh, in terms of providing model information, but we need both an increase in the model, in the boundary layer information, but we also need to get at that information as well. That information needs to be provided to the, uh, to the forecasters. Um, so the, there has been, a, uh, like I said, there has been advances in that, and we expect the advances to continue, uh, all in support of the forecast, the current forecast process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the uncertainty issues. <coughs> see if this pointer works. Yeah, uh, the uncertainty issues. Uh, there's, uh, I think, an increase, at least, curiosity by emergency managers and, and users of our information to know how certain we are about what we're producing. And the, uh, the, this is perhaps a, a, a two-pronged two uh, problem uh, in, in the sense that there is some uncertainty information out there in the form of the ensembles that the forecasters can use. Uh, then there's some information that maybe isn't being produced from the ensembles that could be used. Uh, the issue of delivery, uh, the uh, getting some of this information into the hands of the forecast has been a, a, a bit, bit rough. Uh, getting it through SBN, uh, getting it generated. Um, one thing I want to do is give an example of something we're doing in Eastern Region here with uh, ensemble-based probabilities uh, and trying to take a, a whack at this particular problem. Uh, WPC is producing uh, precipitation <coughs> probabilities from the ensembles, and we're taking those uh, for snowfall, we've got a few offices, uh, I think it's up to around 13 now within our region, uh, pulling in the gridded information, which just recently got onto SBN. Pulling in that gridded information, uh, gridded probabilities for snowfall, uh, we're looking at that to see if forecasters can make any, any meaningful improvements to that by working within GFE and, and, and adjusting the grids. 
and then passing that on to the to customers. And we've gotten a fairly positive response from people like the emergency managers. Uh, having this range of snowfall, basically a 10% a, a and 90% range in terms of what the snowfall uh, min and max may be. Uh, so that's been a pretty positive experience, and we need to go, I think, a little bit further down that road in getting, trying to extract more probabilistic information from the numerical guidance, and also finding ways of delivering the forecast first, and then on in a meaningful way to our customers who, uh, who can use that. Um, the amount of guidance, uh, I think uh, Mark Klein yesterday mentioned it wasn't so much the amount, it was the quality, and I would tend to agree with that, but it's also getting the right ratio, the right, the best uh, uh, model data into the hands of the forecasters. Um, at least in the current forecast process, uh, as I mentioned uh, a moment ago, we're trying to make use of some of the probabilities, getting that into the hands of the forecasters. But by and large, the ensemble information uh, has been somewhat sparse, I guess I could say. Uh, there's been limited, uh, there has been limited uh, data from the gaps, although that's uh, starting to improve. Um, we've not been able to really take advantage of the shrub, I think, in a way that a lot of forecasters would like to. Uh, and, and I don't want to leave post-process data out of this. Uh, post-process data is, a, is an important uh, uh, part of the mix that needs to be provided to the forecasters. Uh, but there has been somewhat limited access to some of the post-process data, uh, particularly from the, uh, the RAP and the HER, for example. Some of the more innovative post-process uh, products have been somewhat slow to get out of the field. The forecasters uh, like some of, the, uh, some of these products, such as the simulated satellite and radar data, they find that, uh, find that useful. And so we need to find ways of getting some of the information that's currently being generated and getting that into, into the hands of the so, uh, over the next one to two years, um, which more or less deals with the current forecast process. Like I said, the forecasters take, uh, the, the, if you went in and looked at the NAWIPs in the field, you'd see dozens of tools there to help them take the data, use it, try to add value, then use that to, to produce the forecast. And um, so, oops. Having the uh, availability of high-resolution model and ensemble data, uh, remember going back to the issue of, uh, of our users wanting higher spatial temporal resolution information, uh, increasing the resolution and making it available to the forecasters. I know Jeff Domago yesterday mentioned some ideas about uh, uh, coming up with a regional ensemble. Uh, I, I think we need to explore that further and see where we can go with that. Uh, the uh, the um, having ways of being a little more uh, agile in terms of getting new fields out of the, uh, out of the test beds and into operations, the R2O issue, uh, needs, some, needs some emphasis in, in work. Uh, addressing some of the issues we see in the models, there's been a lot of talk about model evaluations, uh, and, and that's being addressed in part through some teams that the, the SUs uh, are going to participate in. Um, and so there's, there's work to be done there, and, and that, that has started. Um, an important point here is the uh, RTMA and analyses. I think it was Steve Weiss and the gentleman from um, AWC yesterday mentioned the desire to have uh, more rapidly updating analyses. Uh, this is true for the forecasters in the field as well, uh, in terms of having, if we could do some, something more like a, a near-term gridded, uh, near real-time uh, gridded verification, also for situational awareness. Uh, and, and again, in terms of messaging, having that information for messaging for uh, DSS purposes. Uh, okay, so this is the current forecast process. Uh, in the longer term, uh, this is the question I'm most interested in, actually, because uh, I think it's an important question. And as I mentioned, the NCEP EMC has been a, a great value to the forecast process as it stands now, providing information, forecasters using that, generating the gridded information that they do, the gridded database. Uh, however, that's going to be, I think, changing over time, and we need to find out how we can rely on NCEP and EMC to produce information to support 
what I believe will be a new forecast paradigm. Uh, we need a forecast process that is, oops, hit the wrong button. We need a forecast process that is going to be more coherent, I think, than what it is now, uh, supporting the integrated field structure. If you think back to the diagram Bill Lepenta showed yesterday morning of the structure of the Weather Service, uh, there was a blue side with more of the, the uh, support activities, central processing ops, and so forth. There was a green side. NSEP, for the most part, is in there with the green guys with the field and the uh, regions and so forth. And a process that will tie all of that together is, is needed. Um, what, in one area particularly, uh, we, we need to figure out how ensemble systems factor into that, and I'll say more about that here on the next slide. So what I'm proposing is a, a, a more holistic plan for a forecast process that would encompass such things as probabilistic forecasting. The blends are coming out, the model blends. Uh, uh, there's uh, facets uh, is maybe further down on the horizon, but it's, it's out there. How do we incorporate all of this into uh, a way that the forecasters can produce their, their gridded database? Uh, the roles of the field, the regions, the centers, uh, all need to be defined. Again, this integrated field structure concept uh, needs to be defined. And then there's the obvious linkages of the model production and dissemination to support that whole process. Um, and with a, with a well-defined forecast process, of course, that's then going to allow us to identify the, the tools that will be needed for uh, the forecasters to add, models to add value to the model output where they can. I think uh, we would all agree that the models are getting better. Um, that this man-machine mix between what the forecasters can add value to and uh, what the models uh, do very well, that ratio is changing. And we, uh, we need to give the forecasters the tools they need to do, uh, to do generate the, uh, the gridded forecast database, which in turn is going to support DSS because DSS needs that high resolution. It needs good forecast and warning information. Now, if you take a look at the roadmap, uh, the, the Weather Ready Nation roadmap, you'll see uh, references made to evolving the forecast process and forecaster over the loop. And that's some of what I'm talking about here is how we evolve the forecast process. It's got to be done with the support from organizations like CMC to provide that numerical data. So how do we evolve the forecast process? Forecaster over the loop, not quite sure what that is because I don't know what the loop is. But uh, right now, I would envision that as the forecaster being the manager over the, uh, over the forecast process where they're monitoring, they're interrogating the database as it comes in, and many times it can probably be left untouched, let it go. Uh, but having information which perhaps can come from ensembles, can come from other sources uh, from the modeling community to help them identify where they can add value, I think would be extremely important. So that's the uh, issue, I think, is that the role of the forecaster, the man-machine mix, is changing. And I think, as a result, the support that they get from the modeling community, EMC in particular, is probably going to change because it's going to be different demands. So uh, just to wrap things up quickly here, my suggestion is there's an outgrowth of, of this meeting um, that some group discussions be organized such that we talk about models, analysis, product dissemination, and how that can support the integrated field structure in the context of a next generation forecast process. Um, I think it needs to involve all key players in the weather service. Uh, it certainly needs to involve modelers as well as uh, people in operations. Uh, I would say it needs to involve virtually everybody within the weather service. And when we do this, I think it will lead to a, a, a better defined path to move forward. So I think I'll leave things there. I don't know how much time I have left. Maybe I'll Probably uh, we'll have some discussion right now. So uh, we've the intent was to have eight minutes. Can the intent was to have eight minutes of discussion? So we're kind of past our 12 minute here. So, but it's a great introduction and probably exactly what we needed here. So, uh, is that okay to? Yes, thank you. <laughs>
Do we have questions for Ken, discussion points? Uh, Uh, Ken, thank you, and good morning. Um, on the issue of access to ensembles, um, one of the obvious sources of rich ensemble data is non-domestic models, so the ECMWF, the MOGREFs, and the JAM, et cetera, JMA. Could you clarify exactly what do the field offices as have access to to as routine part of forecasting of non-domestic forecast ensembles? Non-domestic? Yes. As, as in not generated from? U, ECMWF, UKMO, GEM, U, JMA. There's a little bit from uh, ECMWF. There's some Canadian. Uh, my, uh, Jeff Craven, maybe you, you can help answer that too. There's other sources. Very little. I mean, which, other than what we can look on on the web, there's nothing internally. Yeah, there's. there's now, now, I think the WPC has access to some things, but the typical field office does not. Right. Yeah. If you if you're asking what can they get in their office in terms of data, it's very very limited. As Jeff says, we can see some things on, on you know, from websites. So. Ken, I, I, I can't help but thank you for basically, I think you've exposed a little bit of the elephant in the room, that we've been dancing around these issues for a long time and continue to dance around these issues. Your last couple of slides, basically, is I think all of us are struggling as this organization is how do we change a product stream and a methodology for production that's responsible with the tools that we have, or how do we evolve tools in order to do that? And I, I know in our organization with the aerial coverage that we have and the fact that gridded output is and has been used by mariners for a very long time and continues to be used. So gridded production with humans in the, in the loop is a challenge when you're on the scale that we have. Um, so I just want to thank you and I'm hoping that we can keep the momentum going on this discussion is to, to really kind of figure out what are we going to be able to do what, what is the role that's going to ha happen at each level of our organization? That's the other thing I want to thank you for, because all of us have a piece of this. It, it isn't just one part of the organization. Anyway, thanks. So uh, uh, to what Peter was asking, um, we have, uh, if, uh, if not already existing, increasing issues with uh, some of the external foreign data sources that we might want to use in terms of the data being proprietary, you have to pay for it, uh, uh, you have limited access, we have, uh, with the European Center, there are very strict uh, limitations on how we can use their data, and so uh, we would like to use more, but, but particularly UK Met and, uh, and European Center uh, put very clear restrictions on if and how we can use that. Any other comments here before we go on to the next talk? Thanks very much, Ken. Great introduction. Our next speaker is Jeff Craven, representing Central Region. Can you put up the? Can you put up the? Google Doc first and then zoom it to like 150 percent. The Google, if you could put the Google Doc up first and zoom it to like 150 percent, and then we'll kind of scroll through those. Things. Morning, I'm Jeff Craven from Central Region uh, Scientific Services Division. I'm going to go through the uh, challenges first because I had finished my presentation and uploaded it and then realized that I hadn't actually addressed some of the questions. So what I did here is I opened this up to all the central region suits and I put in a little bit of a outline of answers and then the central region suits actually came in and uh, made uh, adjustments to this and I'd actually highlighted some things but apparently 
Uh, so how do I do a oh, slide clicker? Does it have a uh, um, laser then? Yeah, that, that is, it actually is green. Um, I, I'll have to see my eye doctor. Um, so we tried to keep these brief. One of the things that came up was, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of my, my time at SBC. I'm also thinking of the time, and this was actually in Iowa, so that said that there's, been, there's a lot of situations where the, there's a powder keg of cake in the plane or the, the, the corn bells, and you do get thunderstorms, but sometimes they happen at 22Z and sometimes they wait till 6Z. Uh, I, think, I think we're seeing a lot of improvement in those lines, but there's still our confidence in saying it's going to occur within an hour or two is increasing, but there's still situations where convective initiation, the timing of it, uh, can mean the difference between what kind of mode you get as well. So this this came up a lot. Um, there's constantly, and this is always going to be a challenge, and, and I know there's uh, smart people working on this problem, but I get the sense from the answers of just because it's produced doesn't mean we actually get it in the same way that I think it was intended. And there's always... There's always issues of how much you should send, how much information should be condensed, uh, post pre -pro, you know pre process instead of us trying to scramble to put it together at the end, or the process of getting what we say getting into AWIPS is maybe getting to D2D when you need to get all the way into GMP. There's lots of issues like that, which I know we're, we're going to we can scroll up a little bit here. So we want, we, we definitely, I'll hit on the PowerPoint, that first point about needing good hourly output, high resolution out 60 hours. Um, we, uh, we've been cobbling together blends in the field for a while, and we do have a national blend of models project. It will, within a couple of three years, have all the short-term models in it. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we want to continue to cobble together short-term blends in days one to three at the local offices where we, in some ways, have smoke coming out of the back of, of, of AWIPS uh, as we generate these? And, or do we want to try to, you know, I would think that the best situation is a centrally processed blend that's kind of a baby step towards incorporating this into the national blend of models. Because um, that's the initial focus of the national blend of models is global and run twice a day. Once we get into these blends that, in, that have rapidly updating models like the HER and, and the RAP and others, Please make sure you have twice a day mind. isn't going to so we, we, we It's not going to be as easy as just adding the short-term models is how frequently would we update these blends? Because right now, the central region anyways, we do it every hour. Whatever is available every hour, we do a new blend, we do interpolation. Since we don't get all the hourly fields out, we're starting to get more, but we don't get every model's hourly, like for the SREF, in fact, we don't get hourly output out to the field. We get three hourly, so we interpolate it. And we're doing, so we're doing a lot of things kind of crudely with bubble gum and duct tape in the field. And the question is, should we be? Uh, and I'll kind of skip through these in the interest of time. Um, too much guidance, too little. That generally a feel that we, there's, there's too much uh, guidance uh, that we, if we could simplify, um, and we definitely definitely talk about ensembles at the convective allowing scale. 
maybe only one global ensemble. Um, also, a discussion which kind of got into some of the things that Ken said about what, what should we be focusing on, uh, things like uh, synthetic satellite imagery, maybe, you know, maybe sending things, instead of sending all the RH and all these fields uh, all the way out through the extended, maybe we should just send out what the cloud field model thinks is, thing, things like that. We might be able to simplify what we send out. Uh, and we, uh, let's move forward a little bit. Uh, this, now some of these answers came along after a couple of years of polling. Uh, there were white papers that came out, so a combination of MICs and Central Region SUS wrote some white papers a year ago talking about what we would really like to see in the future suite. So this is, some of these, can we get a five to ten member ensemble now and then eventually expand it? We're not. Since we're not modelers in the field, we don't understand what kind of resources that takes. So we're just saying, what, would it be nice to have a 20 to 30 member ensemble? Sure. I, is that feasible? I don't know. Uh, I think that looking at the SREF, which has about, what, 26 members now, I think those are kind of things, yeah, we kind of like that number of, 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 of models. Um, and let's go on to the last one. How much time? Three minutes? Okay. Okay. So why don't we go on to the PowerPoint then? So I tried to, and again, these were answers that were kind of, I actually <clears throat> let them go in and do this. So I, some of you, I was seeing some of these answers for the first time as well, just to be honest. So, but they did kind of fit into what we want to do here. So now, um, kind of thinking over the next two to three years, I ran this past, um, the SSD chiefs, also the Central Region SUS got to see this and, and gave me some input. So um, again, this is a couple of years come in. It's not, not something that we just I just dreamed up here a week ago or so. How could we leverage the success of the HER and the SSEO? Uh, the, the field SUS number one request in Central Region is a convective allowing ensemble. They, they truly believe that that is the, the biggest need right now. Uh, I was privileged to attend, invited to attend the UMAC uh, meeting in August and read their initial report, haven't read the new one, but it seems to align with a, a simplified theme. One, one CAM ensemble and one global ensemble. So what, what do we need? Uh, we need uh, high resolution output out to 36 hours. We are getting that um, to a certain extent. The question is, are we getting enough of it, I would say. We, <clears throat> we have TAFs out at major airports. We go out 30 hours for TAFs. Um, so having occasionally high resolution runs out 36 hours is, is, is needed, and I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, both Eastern and Central Region already have an emphasis on enhanced short-term forecasts. We do it in Central Region roughly every three hours. Uh, so do you need hourly output or output like that every hour? Not necessarily, but at least every three hours we need more than a 15-hour forecast, uh, and we really want an ensemble. And just the, the feel from Central Region SUS is they'd like to see a HER ensemble. Okay, so this is just this is just uh, the feedback I'm getting. Just laying out what we might see. This is basically what happens now with the HER. So most hours you could run you could run it like it is now. Uh, but every six hours we'd want it run out 24 hours. Okay. Um, and I just pick some times, again, I'm not a modeler, I don't know what it's like to construct a modeling suite, so we're just sort of, what would forecasters and students like to see? This is what they'd like to see. Every 12 hours, we'd go out 36 hours, okay? And twice a day, 
on the synoptic times, main synoptic times, we'd like to see it run out 60 hours. And that because, again, I think in looking closely at the output on the NAM nest out 60 hours for the last uh, year or so, there's a lot of interesting information. Now, the location of convection and snow bands and whatnot may be off, but I think the character of what you're going to expect is frequently correct. What, what, are we going to have solid blobs of precipitation? Are we going to have scattered? Thing? Are we going to have high intensity? Or how do you get in the QPF? Are you getting the QPF from long duration light intensity? Or are you getting brief, heavy? And a lot of those things show up uh, in the reflectivity fields for the NAMS out in the day two and three period. So um, we'd like to see the HREF design a time lag. Her, uh, Trevor Alcott's going to show some examples of what they're doing with time lagged her runs here shortly. Um, we want a small ensemble and then eventually build it up as the resources occur. And then at least we don't know how many times we need this 48 to 60 hour run, but it's just guessing a couple times a day. So um, again, just making some suggestions of things that people have said we don't necessarily need. Uh, if we need the space, we need the computing space, we do think that this frequent runs of the HER out 24 hours will benefit the GLAMP performance for aviation. Very few people see a need for 6 and 18 Z runs of models. It's almost, it, you know, they don't take action on them often enough to make it worthwhile. Um, we're wondering if, since we want a CAM ensemble quickly, whether, and again, I, I mean, some of the questions I asked for the asked the branch chief is, do we need do we need a NAM RR to do some of the things? Can we use the wrap as initial conditions for a NAM nest? I, those are just things that I, I don't know the answer to. Do, so I'm, I'm SREF, Again, this is Central Region's opinion. I think a couple runs a day of the SREF would be good. I don't know if it's needed every six hours. And then again, uh, we've talked about merging things down the line, but obviously there's some work that needs to be done with the, the boundary layer and the G global ensembles before we can do that, something like the SREF. So again, uh, appreciate it. How much time are we looking at? Uh, maybe it's time to start discussion. Okay. I suspect there'll be some comments. So, Mike. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Uh, I'd like to see your. I like your first bullet there. I've been pushing for something like that myself. The only question I've got for you is, with the requirement to have uh, tasks go out to 30 hours, is there any r reason why you weren't advocating the running her out more often to 30 or 36 versus 24? Being realistic, I guess. I mean, we 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 understand that. I would say yes. Let's run it out further. Um, the requirements. The, the FAA seems most interested in the next six to nine hours. Um, and uh, our friend Matt was going to address that question. Matt Pruchka from MDL. I'm just, I don't see Dave here or Judy, so I'll just quick answer for LAMP. 30, if you want to support a TAF that goes to 30 hours, 36 on the model run is what we usually recommend. And that's because the model has to finish, it has to get started, it has to finish, the post has to finish, we have to do all of our statistical jazz, and then it has to make it through AWIPS. And all that stuff just kind of adds, piles on time. Since we're at 15 hours right now, I think we just want to take iterative steps. Yeah, I said iterative. I, I reserve the, iter the baby for, for other distinguished gentlemen. Well, thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. So uh, Greg is here for our next talk representing Southern Region. So thanks very much. Good 
morning. Talk about uh, this presentation is probably going to be a little bit more into the weeds than, than what we've seen so far, trying to really address the specific questions posed by Jeff and Mike in their solicitation for the presentation. So uh, I'm chief of STSD at SRH. STSD is the same as the SSD, so I'm the SSD chief for Southern Region Headquarters. Uh, started there in March of, of this year, so I'm relatively new. So, you know, really what I wanted to do is, you know, my background is in, uh, you know, the plains, the plains of Oklahoma and North Texas. So I really wanted to make sure I understood all the needs across the region. So I pulled all the forecast offices through the SUS to get the feedback that I'm going to share with you. So the overview is, is generally the five questions uh, that we're asked to address. Biggest regional weather challenges. You know, is the current suite sufficient or insufficient? Is there too much or too little guidance? What are the needs for the next one to two years? And what are the needs and wish lists for, for longer term? So this presentation will get into the weeds, but if you really want to go down into the weeds and look at uh, farther down in some of the responses from the region, I've got a uh, Word document called Southern Region Field Challenges <coughs> that's within the folder. You can go look at that and read through that. It basically has all responses from, from 16, uh, 16 FOs, and some, there's a few in there from SDSD. But uh, background, I, I don't think we need to cover this too much, but I've got 32 WFOs, four RSDs, you know, seven CWSUs, two or three major airport hubs, depending on what you define as major, DFW, Atlanta, Memphis, and some other bit, very busy airports. So Southern Region covers uh, New Mexico, Florida, and Puerto Rico. New Mexico, we've got a fair amount of terrain out there. West Texas and parts of New Mexico were kind of like deserts. So some of the feedback that I got from the forecast offices dealt with the issues that they face with regard to microclimates, and I'll cover some of that. So basically, again, I pulled all the offices on the NWP challenges and needs. I got about 16 responses, pretty good response rate. So just, you know, going through some of these challenges, obviously, southern region, uh, <coughs> severe weather, severe weather, convective initiation is the big thing. But really, all aspects of convection at all time scales was, you know, showed up on everybody's list. Uh, severity, coverage, mode, threats, dissipation. Uh, another one, definitely number two, is winter weather. We don't get all that much winter weather in the south, so when it does happen, there's always some uncertainty, you know, and they, that's a big challenge for a lot of folks, especially during the watch warning time frame, uh, day one to three. Some of the things that came up, shallow cold air, precipitation type, obviously QPF, terrain effects, uh, Developing flows low in, in the southwest U.S. caused some problems, uh, of course, and what major winter storms. And the next thing on the list was, you know, kind of grouped under smaller spatial scale high impact events, uh, things like onset and dissipation of dense fog, aviation, marine interests, sea fog, bay fog. Um, I heard a lot. There's a lot of uh, coastal territory in the southern region, so I heard a lot from the the coastal uh, offices that sea fog is a major issue with regard to commerce and DSS, decision support services. They're also, you know, under there is uh, microclimates really challenge the models with regard to, uh, you know, lots of, lots of precipitation in the mountainous regions, whereas the nearby flatlands are almost desert-like. So there's a, you know, big variation in weather over short distances. Another key, uh, fire weather, you know, low-level RH and winds key. We've already heard about the importance of boundary layer. And again, this is really pretty important with regard to fire weather concerns. And of course, timing wind shifts, complex terrain, uh, coastline effects, sea breeze, uh, bay breeze boundaries, and inland sea breeze penetration are some of the things that were mentioned routinely in the feedback. So, uh, is the production suite sufficient? Uh, basically, uh, what I heard from the forecast offices with the you know, GFS, uh, GFS that's available in AWIPS is you know, pretty, pretty good for large-scale features and trends. Um, 
you know, so there was the, I think the, the, the general message I got from the, from the field offices were, were pretty good in the, you know, in the uh, four to eight day time frame. They've got enough, enough data that they need. Um, the HRR, you know, it's really kind of changed the way we operate in the forecast offices. It's very good, beneficial for the one to 15 hour forecast, but, you know, you give, you give forecasters something good, they want more of it, right? So basically there's, you know, they want to go out longer, and we'll get to that in some of the, uh, some of the need slides. But, and again, something you've already heard, robust uh, CAM ensemble is desired. Uh, again, this goes back to this is great stuff, you know, HRR going out uh, to 15 hours, but, you know, generally WFOs want more. We've, <coughs> we've already heard that message. So some of the feedback I got with regard to, you know, not sufficient or what, the, what forecasters need more of, uh, QPF, won't spend a lot of time here, but especially the uh, 36 hours, and I, I got feedback that said models usually over forecast in the deserts and under forecast for the mountains. So that's neat, especially places like um, places like New Mexico, which has that large variation in, in weather effects over short distances. Uh, I did hear from one uh, Doe at RFC saying he wants to really use hourly QPF in some of the river models, uh, but he'd like to see you know more accurate QPF to help uh, to help the river forecast process. Also, I heard feedback that uh, some folks are using the PQPF, the probabilistic QPF, but they haven't seen any robust verification to um, tell them how good it is and, or, or the, what the weaknesses may be. So, you know, verification or some type of calibrated PQPF would be desired. And again, we I won't harp on this anymore, but, you know, the, the lack of a robust convective allowing ensemble in AWIPS is is really what the forecasters are, are wanting. Uh, right now, they, like, like Ken said, they can kind of cobble it together with, uh, you know, looking at the web, NSSL, NCAR, uh, Ezreal to support, you know, to support what they can get in AWIPS, but it's kind of a, it's kind of cobbled together inefficient process to be able to, to get what they need. So limitations with the HRRR, um, this is a, you know, basically just kind of a summary of the feedback. The document has a lot more details. If you want to go look at that, hit and miss, uh, you know, feedback for certain situations with convective initiation and convective dissipation, um, limitations with the winds, doing pretty good with the directions and the trends, but not so much the magnitude, especially with higher end events. Uh, I did receive feedback, HRRR. You know, the HRR, the current domain, goes into, just covers Key West, Florida. So, you know, if, if uh, forecasters in Key West are trying to look to their south or especially to their southeast uh, to help the forecast, you know, that HRRR domain cuts off just to their south and east so they can't really see Cuba uh, in those areas, which, you know, may affect what they can put out with the forecast. And... Those limitations contribute to the need for local modeling. Uh, I heard that from several offices that they need, feel like they need to continue to run their local models at relatively high resolutions to get what they need. Um, some SBN and AWIPS limitations. Uh, some offices are doing week two DSS, so I actually had some requests that they want to see the GFS go out to, it's run out to 384 hours, but we only get 10 days or 240 hours out of it in AWIPS. So there's actually some offices that want that data in AWIPS through that time frame. Um, also received some feedback on LAPS, um, the need for sub-hourly output for the HRRR, which we already kind of talked about a little bit this week. And then again, robust, robust ensemble to 24 <coughs> to 30 hours. So when I, when I pose the question, to the office, you know, amount of guidance. Is it, uh, you know, too little, too much, or about right? Basically 14 of the 16 respondents said it's too little. And it's, it's basically, inter you know, interpret that to mean it's too little for what they need to do for the growing DSS needs at their offices. 
So it's not that they're creating too little, but too little for their specific office. So uh, again, it goes back to DSS, growing DSS need. And one of the things that came up with, you know, can, can we use data fusion? Some of these concepts have already been discussed this morning and yesterday, but what can we do to, you know, limit that amount of data that needs to be sent over the SBN? We can't, you know, there's not an unlimited, not, not unlimited bandwidth there, obviously. So can we can we be smart and you know send things like ensemble <coughs> anomaly fields versus the entire suite of the <coughs> of the data? And again, contextualization of ensemble output may help those bandwidth issues. So what's needed next two years? You know, to summarize, you know, improved modeling and support of DSS. And again, we'll talk about you know obviously convective initiation. Uh, QPF, digital aviation services, more and more offices are starting to, to get into digital aviation services and do, uh, you know, basically write tasks using their grids. Uh, won't, go through all of, won't go through all of these, but, uh, you know, I, that just kind of summarizes the feedback. Again, one thing that shows up over and over, the uh, robust, robust ensemble cam output for at least 36 hours, 30 to 36 hours. And then some other miscellaneous uh, things I threw in there that was their feedback. Um, you know, with the location of, of southern region, you know, Texas and New Mexico, you know, we still get issues, data void regions off to the uh, south, uh, Mexico, oceans, coastlines. There's only so many buoys. In an ideal world, there will be a lot more buoys. Um, forecasters would love to see the ability to forecast at, uh, you know, micro scale, two kilometers or less, help with uh, sea breeze, land breeze, wind, things like that at the local level. And we've already talked about the HRR output, and I've also had requests for like Hurricane Wharf. They'd love to see that output in AWIPS. Right now, it's just really on the web. So. I'll kind of kind of wrap up here, but this is I had so many responses on you know longer term needs and wish list. But I'll just kind of hit a couple of these. Uh, and again, this is you know three years, four years, five years, or farther out. Uh, there's a feel like there's a need to have you know at least a deterministic run of the HRRR out to 84 hours or longer. Seems crazy now, but hopefully modeling modeling and uh, supercomputer power will allow that. Also got over here on the right kind of a group of uh, RTMA requests, requests for 15 minute RTMA and, and have the RTMA, you know, that real time analysis include mixing height, transport winds and maybe other fields. Um, and again, you know, other miscellaneous things are in the wish list. Uh, you know, I had some folks wanting, you know, the MAG website with all the model data it would be great to have a geospatial capability because I think a lot of offices are, are kind of turning to that for some of the supplemental data that doesn't make it over the SBN. So this is just my summary. Again, if you want even more into the weeds, Southern Region Field Challenges document will we'll give you that. Uh, and again, I won't harp on it anymore. Short-term ensemble data and the meaningful packaging of that data is, is really what the forecasters are wanting. And again, higher resolution, two kilometers or less, uh, grid point spacing is desired. So that's all I have. Time for a few questions for Greg about the southern region situation. Greg, I'll, I'll start by just coming one thing quickly on laps. Uh, uh, EMC and Estrel have been working together to have a, a new 3D uh, now cast field, this rapidly updating analysis and discussion with the regions and uh, MDL and so on toward that. And that really is meant to be a last replacement centrally produced, not a, a uh, way whips produced kind of thing. So I hope that sounds like the right direction. Maybe you've already heard about that. How about the prediction component of flats? Well, this is a now cast kind of thing. So that, you know, the, the 
the HER and HREF is really your uh, direction to move out and really to be able to have that taking care of the NWP asset in that regard. So many points, always a question to ask on. So the 84 hours HER, is it the high resolution aspect that you want to have to 84 hours, the rapid refresh, or both? Both. Essentially, to be able to get the hourly output on high resolution, you know, what, what's... But, I mean, the, the, rep, the rapid, do you want to want that cycled every hour, too? All the way up to 84 uh, hours? No, not necessarily. That's, that's the... Not, right, not necessarily every hour out to 84 hours. Correct, I would say. It's every six times. hours or something would be... Yeah, couple, couple, yeah, a couple of times a day would be great. I guess you brought up a lot of emphasis on, you know, the, the uh, marine environment also, uh, Greg, in your talk with the coastal areas. Uh, can, can you comment more just to, about that aspect, uh, marine and, and clouds, uh, cloud fog issues, uh, and what you heard from the field? Yeah, essentially, I, you know, and more details are in the, in the document. I heard a lot from the coastal offices and the Tampa Bay office saying, you know, the models currently aren't very good at forecasting the onset and dissipation of fog. And some, some place like Tampa Bay is, is kind of special because there's a large bay, uh, fairly sizable airport near the bay. They have, uh, you know, uh, if you get fog in the bay, that obviously is going to disrupt aviation. Um, and also, if there's, if there's, you know, the sea fog, it can disrupt commerce in, in and out of the Tampa Bay area. So I, you know, I basically, there's tools for it. There's pretty good tools for it. But the general message I got from some of the offices uh, that experienced the fog issues is they overforecast it. You know, high false alarm rate with with the fog onset, in, in, including the Bay areas and, and places like that. So they wanted to, they wanted to see an improvement in in that aspect because it does have high impact aviation commerce. other comments or questions for Greg? Okay, thanks very much, Greg. Appreciate that. Our next speaker is Andy Edmond, representing uh, Western Region with some help from Trevor Alcott. All right, we're going to do call a little bit of an audible here. Um, the SSDs talk quite a bit, and so when we were talking last night, rather than me just saying the same thing you've already heard from Eastern and Southern and Central, uh, I want, I want, I've asked Trevor to present some stuff. But before I do that, I want to do two things real quickly. Last year when we were here, we talked about the need for training, and we had the GFS 13 rolling out and the HER rolling out. And I just want to shout out to a couple of people. Uh, Bill Bua, are you here, Bill? Bill was great. And Mark Iredell, I mean, been getting the GS, you know, the GFS 13 training out. I mean, we did that in a pretty short period of time. It was pretty focused. I got a lot of good feedback. So again, Bill, thanks you. Did. I, you and I remember met a lot of times at eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night. A lot of good things happened there. The her. <laughs> it, it was actually a louder clap than that, but. Um, the HER, um, again, that was a brand new model, a brand new operational model. And, uh, you know, there was a module put together, Stan Benjamin's group, particularly Curtis Carey, and I know you're here, Curtis. I mean, those guys really stepped up. They, they really pulled it together. We wouldn't have had a HER training module without the effort of that group, and I really do appreciate it. And I'm not doing justice to all of, the, all of your folks who got involved, but it was a creative way of getting a short focus trading done and out to the field, and I know it was appreciated. Uh, just a couple of real, couple, couple comments real quickly. I'm not going to show my slides. I did the same sort of thing. I just want to highlight the importance of the RTMA and IRMA. We need to continue to have that updated every, you know, twice a year. There was a commitment made by Bill Lafenta a couple years ago that is paying off today, and will continue to pay off. That, that, that software is critically important to the verification, the blend efforts, bias correction, da-da, 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 it's going to be important in our future. 
if we're going to do value-based decision-making in the future, that's the thing that's going to be there. Now, I'm going to change gears, and here's what we're calling an audible. Two years ago, I was here, and we were talking about how the world's changing. You no longer look at 500 millibar fields. If you are, you're a dinosaur, if you're looking at model data that way. And we showed some stuff that we were doing in Western region with the ensemble situation awareness. We were using ensemble data, but not looking at the data, but teasing the information out of that data. Well, we're at the same sort of crossroads here. But the HER is a game changer. I mean, with that hourly data simulation system, that framework 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say it's one of the smartest things this organization did. We're asking, you heard Jeff Craven, we're asking for more of it. And, it's, and, and Bill Lepenta keeps talking about, I want the requirements. Well, some of the really cool stuff that Trevor's doing, I think, is a great example of where we're going, where the fastest program is going, and to me is one of the, is one of the big justifications for what we're asking. For those of you who don't know, Trevor used to work in SSD. Now he works for a much better manager at a much better location. He's over at OER working for Stan in Boulder. Thanks, Andy. I really appreciate the time here. And uh, the motivation for this isn't just because Andy's a good guy. Uh, this is the Weather Service has been asked to change its tune lately. And being asked to talk about probabilistic forecasts without really having a way to disseminate them yet and without really having uh, reliable, calibrated guidance out there to, to base those discussions on. When you're talking about the probability of a hazard, uh, and talking to various decision makers, you need something to fall back on, something that you know is reliable, calibrated. And there's a big gap in the modeling field in that area. And the following talk is going to discuss uh, one of the ways that, that we're changing that. This is a multi-agency collaboration. This is between uh, Israel GSD and EM. The NCAR is involved on both the verification and social sciences sides, and we're going to bring in a lot of uh, weather service folks to look at this guidance pretty early on and give us some feedback. Definitely a, a two-way street trying to start there. Uh, first of all, we're going to be talking a lot about time-lagged ensembles, and if you had infinite resources, time-lagging is probably not the route you would go. It falls under the category of do what you can with what you have when you have it. And just showing an example of what we're doing here, uh, these are three successive forecasts for the uh, Boulder, Colorado flood in 2013. Uh, it's just an example of composite reflectivity valid a uh, couple hours into the probably the worst part of the event. And you're going to see the good, bad, and the ugly of timeline ensembles here. Uh, first of all, the good. You do see some spread here between the various solutions at a three hour, two hour, and one hour lead time. There is some uncertainty information in there. Uh, the bad part is that, uh, of course, as you go further back, the runs are less and less skillful. So is it necessarily valuable to bring in ensemble members that maybe don't represent the actual solution? And the ugly part is that even with all of these solutions, if you kind of step back and squint, it's a, it's a decent forecast, but none of them properly capture the orientation of the heaviest precipitation there. So it's kind of your uh, outside the envelope issue again, where a time lagged ensemble, I'm going to show some examples of this later, tends to be under dispersive, almost no matter what you do, how far back you go. Uh, first of all, we're doing a three member time lagged ensemble now. Uh, I've got some evidence for why we're doing that a couple slides down the road. Uh, and a lot of what I'm going to be doing is initially focused on six-hour QPF. So uh, just as an example, say we're forecasting from 0Z to 6Z. In at least an experimental mode, there's roughly a, a two-hour latency with the HER. So say your 0Z uh, run not available, of course, neither is the 23Z. The most recent data you have at 0Z is from the 22Z run. 
So your three members would be 22, 21, 20. Now, one reason we're doing this, we figured there's no point in issuing a six-hour QPF if two hours of the forecast period have already happened. So when we're producing these forecasts kind of in the 0 to 0 0.30 time frame, uh, we're using the most recent data available, and that forecast starts right at 0Z. So some of the trade-offs that happen with time lagging ensembles. I mean, first of all, you'd imagine more members would mean more spread, right? Uh, that's, that one's kind of a no-brainer, but the problem is that if you go out further and further in time, uh, those older runs have lower skill. So do they add value, I mean, at any weight? even at a, at a lower rate. The other thing that happens is your lead time shortens. Uh, you can see if I were to go with older and older runs, that uh, maximum forecast horizon just keeps coming further and further back. So there's a, there's a trade-off there where we don't want to have too many members. You can't go too far out of time. Uh, furthermore, is that spread useful? Uh, do we get reliable forecasts when we go further and further out? And uh, hitting on the, the weighting side of things, if a, if a member does not add value at 100%, does it necessarily add value at 10%? If you're going to put a small weight on a member, why not just leave it out in the first place? So that's something we've been experimenting with, just in the interest of keeping the ensemble small. You also find once you add more than five or six runs, you don't get any more value. So this is usually the problem we're dealing with. Uh, this is very idealized, but kind of focused on QPF, you have a biased and underdispersive ensemble. So one of the key aspects of this project is we need to produce reliable calibrated forecasts. We need to deal with both of these problems. We could do it simultaneously. There's some techniques to address that. Uh, we've chosen to do it in two steps. So first focusing on bias correction. On this example, uh, this is a very geeky slide, but uh, just saying we're basically shifting, make sure I pointed the right screen, we're shifting the forecast climatology, say this uh, gray line here, a zero to six hour QPF, towards the observed climatology, in this case taken as the stage four QPE analysis. So where we might be focused on a one inch and six hour threshold, what we're actually doing is we're looking for a 1.23 inch and six hour threshold. So basically just shifting the, the model climatology over. So that's one way that we can deal with bias correction of each member. We do this separately for all of the lead times that we're including in the ensemble. So how much of a climatology do you need to do that? Uh, I think Tom Hamill and I have had some good discussions about this, and I, my goal with this was basically to keep that climatology as short as possible. And You'll find that, uh, just showing bias for six-hour QPF, you want to be as close as possible to that uh, one line. Uh, with no bias correction, you're up here, uh, basically producing one inch and six-hour amounts much more often than you should. But once you use five forecasts, 10 forecasts, and 25, you have almost no bias all the way out to a three inch and six-hour threshold. 25 forecasts, if you're doing this based on six-hour data, that's only two weeks of data for effective calibration. Now, this was spring 2015. That was a very wet period, so that's probably a uh, best-case scenario. You might want to go to 50 or 100 forecasts, 50 in real time right now. So the key is that we can do real-time bias correction with a relatively short training data set for QPF amounts that actually border on extreme values. Uh, maybe extreme is the wrong word, but certainly approaching flash flood guidance values. What about spread? So this is, this is definitely a challenge with time lagged ensembles. And with most people working on this, they're using a uh, spatial filter. So basically, if you are forecasting the probability of an event at one point, you look in at some radius around that point and treat all of the model forecasts, all those points, as additional ensemble members. Now, this makes a lot of sense in scenarios where uh, you have large location errors, right? You're kind of forcefully putting in some location errors into the ensemble. 
And if you kind of iterate a few times, this is uh, just looking at conus-wide probability of half an inch in six hours. If you iterate with various radii from no spatial filter all the way up to 100 kilometers spatial filter, you can actually get to almost perfect reliability. Depending on the season and the area the U.S. are focused on, and to some extent the threshold, this varies from about a 60 to 100 kilometer spatial filter to achieve overall reliability across the U.S. Uh, just showing an example for the one inch threshold, here's uh, three members on top and six members on the bottom. Is there much advantage to using six members versus three? I would say based on this and some of our other work, no. We're actually okay with using three members and a uh, fairly large spatial filter. You can see in this case with uh, uh, either an 80 or 100 kilometer spatial filter and three members, again, almost perfect reliability for forecasts of one inch in six hours, which is a fairly high threshold. All grid points are created equal, but some are more equal than others, especially those in complex terrain. <laughs> so what happens if you apply a 100 kilometer spatial filter everywhere? Well, you run into some pretty big issues when you get into places like northern Utah. Say you have three ensemble members, and these various colors are predicting areas where uh, each member exceeds some threshold. If you wanted to forecast the probability at this point, you'd probably get about 20% total uh, points covered by those members. You'd probably get about the same value out here with the Great Salt Lake. Is the probability of precip really as high out here to the west of the mountains as it is right over them? No. And in fact, you probably want to use a, a much smaller spatial filter in that case. So what I've done, and this is very experimental, uh, just for the initial version, is to vary the size of that spatial filter depending on how complex the terrain is. I, I kind of have a, a crude algorithm for uh, identifying where we have complex terrain. Basically subtract a smoothed terrain height from a non-smooth. And in those areas, I try applying a smaller spatial filter. And looking at the verification, there's, the sample size is a little small, so these are a bit noisy. But overall, looking at these complex terrain areas, a 12-kilometer spatial filter ends up producing pretty good reliability, especially at these higher probabilities, versus using a 80 uh, or larger kilometer spatial filter over kind of flat terrain. So put that together, and here's some forecasts from yesterday. These are on a website that's publicly available. I'm going to start sending that link out, hopefully in the next week, as soon as we have our complete suite of guidance. Uh, just an example for one-tenth inch of precipitation in six hours. You can see that uh, those effects of the complex terrain algorithm kind of helping out there in western Washington and also in southwest Idaho. Uh, same kind of plot but for one inch in six hours and something else we're working with uh, this is not just about QPF so here's an example of probability of one inch per hour snowfall. Other hazards coming down the road this is an attempt to to cover a wide range of of hazards that you want to be talking about at a weather forecast office or at national centers. Uh, first of all, heavy rainfall, where our proxy is model QPF, and we're using stage four and or MRMS, it's kind of open for calibration. Uh, we'll get into snowfall using a snowfall algorithm that is, comes directly out of the model microphysics. It's a, a pretty new thing. Uh, getting into the spring, we're going to be looking at more severe parameters and attempting to calibrate each one of those based on what, what we think is the best truth data set. I think the trickiest one of those is probably mesocyclones, where we need to do some post-processing and rotation tracks. Uh, last but certainly not least, we're going to be getting into aviation hazards. Uh, calibration there, you can imagine, is, is also tricky. Uh, but we're going to work with a, a new post-process field out of the uh, out of the herd and attempt to calibrate using either ASOS or some other available truth data set. Uh, a key aspect of this I haven't really hit on is that this 
post-processing system is meant to be member agnostic. It doesn't matter how you're coming up with, with those members. It could be a full ensemble, it could be a time-lagged ensemble with a spatial filter, but this project is designed to come up with a flexible post-processing system so we get reliable calibrated forecasts of various hazards from whatever ensemble happens to be running. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly hit on the timeline. Basically, it's uh, designed around the various experiments. So winter weather experiment, we'll have our winter fields, uh, the SBC HWT, we're going to be deploying our severe weather fields. Uh, flash flood experiment, we'll focus more on those higher end QPF values where we're uh, in quite calibrated beyond about three inches in six hours. And as we get into the next year or so, uh, more focus on aviation hazards, more refinement, and a lot of this two-way conversation happening with the WFOs. Lastly, speaking of other ensembles, uh, we've been discussing a lot another way uh, of coming up with those members. Basically, a storm scale ensemble system focused on the herd. This is a, just a preliminary way that we think that uh, you can come up with a uh, kind of initial operating capability for a storm scale ensemble system. A uh, key aspect of this is ensemble data assimilation. Uh, one uh, typo here, this, this is 40 members and six members. I wish you could do it on six cores. Uh, just showing an example from a uh, simulation that David Dowell ran for us. Uh, this is your real-time HER forecast on the left, MRMS observations. And this is a two-hour forecast initialized using this ensemble data simulation. And you can see that you end up with a much better representation of these individual storms. Uh, I'm going to kind of defer more to Stan and Curtis for answering questions on this part, but at this point I'm open to questions. And Andy. So, we've been talking about, over the last two, three years, the world's changing. Um, we need the best model data in the world, but we're not looking at it. We're using that as input in the systems like this so we can do the sorts of concepts we're talking about in facets. Facets, facets is just a fancy word for using probabilities to up our game and come up with the next generation service program. And this is a tangible step in that direction. It's real, it's coming, it's happening. So that's why the SSDs are proposing what we're proposing to enhance the HER framework. Uh, I want to say one more thing before we before we before we break. I forgot to acknowledge one person. Uh, as part of the HER and GFS implementation, we had to do a lot of things to get in the with data stream and all that sort of stuff. And there were some key players at Mandel, but there's one more than any other that was a key player, and that was Becky Crossgrove. And I just want to give a shout out to her. Um, the highest compliment I can say is if I'm trying to get something done. And I'm in a dark alley with a bunch of bureaucrats, and I get to choose one person, I choose Becky. So, so comments, questions? And I guess in the broader topic here, so Matt. Very cool stuff, of course. Um, I have about two hours worth of technical note comparing stuff. A lot of it is comparing notes with the algorithms that Tom Hamill is building for later projections, global model stuff. Um, we recently embarrassed ourselves doing a POP12 using a bias correction or a quantile correction. And I'll just briefly note one of the problems that comes with that technique is it assumes that your correction at one point a lot for heavier or lighter precipitation is informative for other values of precipitation. And so what ended up happening is that the model way over forecast a heavy rain event and ending up learning some bad lessons about POP12. And we ended up with a donut hole in her POP12. So there's lots and lots of cool experiences. 
about the radii. Tom has a really neat technique that he's using for dealing with the complex terrain and the downscaling. So uh, we were talking yesterday. Were you here yesterday? Great. Okay. There's a statistical post-processing workshop because we're way too balkanized, and we're trying to fix that. And when I say balkanized, that includes globally. And we got tentative commitments so far from UK Met Office and the Canadians to show up for that. So it looks like a pretty good party, and I hope you or someone smart enough like you can be here with that. Thanks, man. We should definitely touch base about some of the details. I'll make myself available. So I'd like to kind of connect the, this presentation with where Ken started the morning, where uh, he, you know, Ken very logically, you know, brought up the glaringly obvious that we don't really have a a vision and a plan that's articulated as to how we're going to use all this information into a new forecast process. Uh, so we obviously have to do that, but it's more than just a bunch of guys and gals sitting around a table, you know, bringing stuff up. Actually, this kind of work can inform that in terms of you know, what the new science, the new techniques are that will allow us to move to a new process. So, is it, would you like to? Would you or Andy like to talk about any of the stuff that you're working on that you think actually, especially with the probabilistic products that you've done, what have you learned uh, that would lead us to a new conclusion uh, as to how we could use this information to provide forecasts? Because uh, not all requirements come from users if we want something. Sometimes you know, new techniques and new technology can show us better ways of doing things. You know, I, I think it leads into a big challenge we have right now. Let me just talk about a forecast funnel. I think we have this probabilistic forecast funnel now where we're gradually expanding our suite of guidance and calibrated guidance, but we're really limited in what we can get out in our official products. You know, there is only one probabilistic product in the Weather Service, and that's POP.01. And I think as this guidance suite expands, we need more than... Facebook to be able to express that information. I don't know if Andy, you can speak to that. Yeah, no, this is one of the things, that, you know, that's why FACETS is a 10-year program. We're going to have to ferret this out. I'm, I'm going to be a little bit radical here. I, I think we actually have two problems. You know, a lot of what we're doing right now is to improve the confidence of our forecasters. Uh, the folks down in the spring experiment did a really cool little thing a couple years ago where they took, took a case study and he took, I don't know, 15, 20 forecasters and said, issue the warning on 50% confidence. And they had folks who were issuing right away to never issue. I mean, it was the whole gamut. So we need to start providing information to, to improve the calibration and consistency of our own forecasters and our own internal forecast process. And then we have another challenge, too. When it comes to the public, my mom doesn't want probability. She wants me to tell her if it's going to snow or not tomorrow and how much and when is it going to start. And so I think, you know, how we convert these probabilities into tangible things that people can take action on is, is a really great subject. Russ Schneider and I were having a few beers about a year ago, and if you stop and think about severe weather probabilities for a, for a, a high-risk event, the probabilities of having severe weather organized big outbreak is like 10%, 15%. If I was to come stand in front of all of you and say, hey, the risk today is 10% of a big outbreak, you go, eh. But cells, or not cells, oops, field, field. SBC uses the word, they change, they change that 10% into high risk, and people take actions. And that's really, that's the sort of stuff we're going to have to figure out over the next 10 years as to, we know we can do better. We know we can use this information to tease out really important information about significant weather events, but how do we communicate that to our mothers, to our spouses, to our kids? And that we don't have answers for yet, except we do have some pioneers. I think SBC is doing some really cool work in this area right now, and FACETS, that's why it's getting the funding it's getting to do that. So it's not an answer, but it's... Hey, thanks very much, Trevor and Andy. And uh, we conclude before our break with Jean Petrescu, is Jean here? 
There we go. Perfect. Sure. Uh, and we're going to save Bill Ward on the Pacific uh, region until after break and then followed by discussion on MEG, the Model Evaluation Group, with Jeff Manikin. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm the regional scientist in Alaska Region ESSD. Okay, and uh, this, this uh, uh, presentation is a little bit different than the others, although I have to say that the, the general, being in general, ideas are, are identical. I mean, all the messages that have been stated this morning um, you know, we're, we're, uh, um, have many of the same issues, many of the same questions. But this is, overall, this is a bit more general. You know, the, the question, you know, trying to answer, what are the biggest challenges uh, facing the Alaska region? Um, I mean, it, it, you know, for us, it's, it's probably number one is the rapidly increasing growth in our high-latitude uh, DSS with the changes in the Arctic melting sea ice. And along with that is this, you know, ever-growing requirements list uh, to, to support our stakeholders. And it's not just weather services. It's uh, dealing with the situation. It's, it's all the agencies. It's the state of Alaska. It's the DOD. It's um, you know, it's uh, um, emergency management. Um, I mean, with you know cruise ships coming next year potentially, uh, with, with all these other activities, but right now there really isn't the infrastructure at all these various levels to be able to support that. So we're we're trying to you know figure out uh, you know what our role is and what we need to provide so that uh, um, so that we're supporting our stakeholders, supporting uh, you know, the, the um, protection of life and property. Yeah, another big issue is inadequate data, a guidance and support, you know, a pathway towards um, more automated grid editing to allow our forecasters to, to focus on these more critical activities. And I'll get a little bit more into that in, in a little bit, but you know, we're talking about, you know, especially about guidance, you know, whether it's in, in, enough and whether it's adequate. And you know, right now, that, the question is there, that answer is, is no for us. Uh, the last issue is you're serving a stakeholder database, or serving a stakeholder base that is you know, unique. I mean, you know, CONUS is a big place. There's a lot of variations, but then we have some fairly unique issues, fairly unique, um, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders as well. And in, in the context I have it here, it, it's really more towards resource allocation, where, you know, something's produced for the CONUS, it's, you know, gets sort of the variable, you know, square peg, and for us, you're trying to put that square peg into a round hole, and it takes resources. We try to kind of shave off those edges. And for all the reasons here, this, those are the primary reasons why we you know, stood up the, the Arctic test bed. And um, I think it's absolutely critical that NSF is, is a big role, big big partner with this in, in this endeavor. And does the current production suite help with challenges? And the you know, short answer is, is, I mean, yes to a degree, but no in, in, in sort of this bigger picture where there, there's lots of gaps in available guidance. But, but the good thing is, in, from the talks yesterday, that there's a lot of activity that's going on, a lot of activity that's uh, work that's going to be expanded to Alaska, that's being done for Alaska. So th that's a good thing. Um, but th there's still more to be done, and I think the one thing I do want to stress is that, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the HER will be expanded to Alaska, which is great, it's wonderful, that helps us quite a bit. But it's not just expanding the HER to Alaska, it's making sure that um, the, the details work, to make sure that the, the boundary layer issues um, are you know, that we try to resolve some of the issues that are different, and that's um, you know, part of the uh, our biggest challenge is that you know the guidance times that we have either can't resolve a lot of the uh, high impact issues um, due to resolution, or there's boundary layer problems, or there's uh, microphysical problems, um, or possibly even. Uh, um, Initialization issues that we're there that we seem to be always constantly dealing with. So, with that in mind, um, you know, as things are expanded to Alaska, that uh, we, that you know, maybe an extra effort needed to you know, make some of these adjustments and try to resolve some of these issues that, that are ongoing. And you know, in terms of um, this grid, grid editing efficiency problem that we have. Our forecast offices right now, especially when there's active weather, are pretty stressed. And in a lot of cases, the, the operations sort of, sort of collapses into this uh, meteorological triage, as we call it, to try to deal with um, the most important factors. 
But, you know, and again, I'll do a good majority of time spent doing our grids is really to put in details that the models, again, don't resolve or to correct the physical uh, problems. And until we sort of move, uh, have solutions for this, uh, we, we have limited capacity for our forecasters uh, to do a DSF. So this is, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the bigger issues that we've had that we're trying to uh, find solutions for. Um, and I think, I'm not going to dwell too much on the last statement there, limited tool to assess the and uncertainty, but that's been, uh, you know, a major theme this morning. And is the current amount of guidance just right? Uh, to answer that, I, I think, again, that's the same, same, um, same question, or the same answer to that is, well, it depends on, um, you know, how relevant that guidance is. And, and I think basically the answer is no at the moment for several items, but um, you know, the real answer is to try to get guidance that's relevant to the, the, to the questions that we're trying to answer. And along with that, just to point out that the you know, majority of the, our, our DSS needs you tend to be complex. You know, in many cases, you know, we're not just dealing with the atmosphere or maybe even hydrology. Um, we're dealing with other components um, that, you know, volcanic ash. You know, how much ash did this volcano that erupted put into the atmosphere? Or with road weather situations, it, it's a, it's a, there's social input into that. You know, how much traffic do we expect during this time frame when these, these snow showers are going to develop or, or other questions like that? So there's other components um, that information that the forecasters may or may not um, have that we need in the future to sort of help answer some of these uh, uh, stakeholder issues. Um, another point is, um, and this has already been addressed, is to take advantage of post-process data to build the correct tools, the correct tools that are relevant to answer uh, the questions that, that we're trying to answer. Um, getting relevant guidance to the field, and you know, ourselves and Pacific regions are the, the first two regions to be connected to IDP, and I think we'll, we'll be fully on IDP within a week, and that's a huge boon to, for us. I mean, we now have, you know, 500 megabits per second um, uh, network coming into Alaska region headquarters and a couple hundred megabit per second going into WFOs. So we have this, this uh, you know, big pipe, but, but yet we, we still um, kind of are dealing with some of the same issues and trying to get some of you know, this new guidance to us in terms of just, just the details. Um, the protocols, um, you know, we, we have to do a lot of work at Alaska region headquarters to write scripts to pull in the data and to post-process the data for our own use. And this is something where you know, we'd like to uh, work with NSEP to try to come up with better solutions for that. Um, you know, even the dateline. You know, if we're using nomads, we have to pull in data from east and west of the dateline, steam it together at, at the grid level, and then we can adjust it. So in the next uh, one to two years, and, and again, I, I, you know, a lot of these items are being worked on. So that, that's, that's great. Um, you know, couple ocean and your ice models. Uh, the second bullet is models that appropriately take into account sea ice. And this isn't just at sort of a GFS scale. This is, you know, as we get to her, this is, this is one of these items that, you know, it's important that we have um, you know, constantly updated sea ice information in the HER per se, or the, or the NAM rapid refresh, that can take into account leads that open up along the coast. If we have a lead opening up along the coast, you know, suddenly, you know, temperatures are 30 degrees warmer, we have snow showers, we have dense fog, we have severe icing for aviation. So those are the kind of things that, that you know, it's important to kind of look at some of these, uh, of these uh, uh, other, other details. Um, already, you know, Andy already mentioned the RTMA IRMA. Um, for us, this is, this is a big deal. Um, we don't have a lot of observations, but we need to utilize the, the data we have appropriately. You know, perhaps there's other um, information that that we get from remote sensing that could ultimately be included in the RTMA IRMA, because that, that's really sort of our, our avenue and path to uh, be able to um, you know, calibrate the ensemble, calibrate uh, uh, you know, guidance produced verification. Um, in terms of uh, the model shortcomings, uh, yeah, the GFS upgrade was, was, was good. Uh, you know, its current resolution is similar to that of the NAM, uh, NAM 12 at least. But we're definitely, you know, we're definitely tell by the output of the data that there, there's, um, the GFS isn't kind of fitting the bill at that, that resolution for, for our needs. There's, there's definitely lots of boundary issues. There's momentum transport issues that we're noticing, precipitation issues. Now, verification, uh, again, we don't have a lot of data. 
um, but we have additional non-standard data that would, you know, especially for high impact events, that you know, we, we need to start including those high impact event information into this you know, verification process so that, that we're measuring what, you know, your really important factors. Uh, you know, Long-term product needs and the same question I think that's being answered. It's really we need to figure out, to determine what the role of forecasters in the future is, how we approach, approach IDSS for impact. Um, I think some of the um, you know, key points already mentioned, boundary layer improvements are critical, uh, continue to you know, develop fully couple of models. And I, I think what's also very important is to develop guided tools, processes, and training, and training to ultimately address the, the above question is what the role of forecasters in the future. Thank you. Thank you much, Gene. Uh, this is an opportunity for questions and Arctic polar issues. Me. Hi, Gene. Nice to see you again. Um, and as was at the, uh, the YAP meeting we talked about, I, I assumed in your coupled models that the role of land and hydrology, because um, that's really important for, you know, river breakup and that, you know, long seasonal cycle, I mean, there are things that you know, just stay in place until the breakup. So I, I assume you meant all of that in, in terms of the coupled modeling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hydrology. Yeah. Perhaps ice needs to be dealt with. Sure, sure. And, okay, okay. rivers, et cetera. Okay, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on what you meant with uh, uh, RTMA, IRMA, completely different approach? Do you mean add to it, or do you mean go back to the drawing board? Good question. And um, I think, you know, really, there's probably components that we may need to go back to the drawing board on, especially in this environment where, you know, in-situ direct observations, standard automated observations are, are limited. Um, and, I mean, this is sort of uh, uh, you know, the perfect, perfect world I, I'm, I'm talking about here, but um, and I'm not really sure of the details of what's possible from a scientific standpoint, but you know, we, the observations that we have, you utilize them as much as possible. I utilize the fact that, okay, there's an observation here, it's on the south aspect on the mountainside. There's information there that there's other south, southern aspects all over the place that, okay, well, this observation might, you know, provide other information to the same aspect or the same land surface type. You know, take into account the way the sun moves during the day, that the aspect changes during the day in, in the train, the train. Wind, wind is a huge issue for us. That's probably maybe our number one forecast challenge overall, and it takes a lot of time to adjust the grids to put gap winds in, to put channel winds in. Um, and, and right now, and the, the RTMA Irma, they're, they're, they're definitely working on different improvements to that to try that to, to account. Um, but perhaps there's, and we'll see how that works, uh, or you know, we'll evaluate that process. But, but perhaps there's another component to it that we try to downscale um, winds to move through the channels uh, from uh, uh, you know, the, the parent grids and so forth, so that we're trying to get some sort of realistic uh, uh, wind flow as opposed to trying to rely on just the observations, which they're, they're few and far between, and really don't capture the, the, true, the true wind environment. And sec second question, if you don't mind. Um, I noticed your uh, remark in one of your slides on uh, coastal erosion. Is that mission creep here, or what happens there? Because typically, that is, uh, USGS uh, Co uh, Corps of Engineers are the, are the people who, who deal with that. Is that something that, that you found has become a part of the uh, of the, the mission of the weather service in Alaska. Well, the, the erosion part, no, and probably should have used the term inundation, but be, because of uh, the melting permafrost, basically what, what's happening is coastal inundation sort of means the same thing as coastal erosion for us, because every, every storm we're seeing now, we're seeing both. We're seeing inundation and we're seeing erosion. Um, but, but really, I guess in this context, it, it's inundation. And, and, and with that, um, you know, it, we have a uh, you know updated uh, ETSS model for us, which um, you know is connecting both the, the Arctic and the Bering Sea, and it's that that in itself is great. We're, I think we're definitely seeing big improvements immediately with that. The next step is to add sea ice into that, to add shore fast ice into that, because a lot of times we have these storms, we have ice involved, and it plays a big role. 
Gene, you brought up the uh, ICE issue also in your talk, and this is probably the best place to comment. So you heard Bob Gumbine's talk yesterday, and Bob's in the back. And uh, I think we're aware at our end, just to let you know about this issue about having good ICE information, including ICE fraction concentration. So Bob uh, has been working on and we've been having some discussions with the Canadians about that to have better ice fields, and we know that's needed for you as well as for the Great Lakes area. Bob, do you want to comment any further on that? or? Um, well, I'll, you know, the basic is, as Stan said, and uh, Gina and I have been talking also, uh, and the uh, uh, novel thing, which I think Word, sounds like Word hasn't made, uh, made its way to Gene yet, because uh, it's been done as a research project, is that uh, we've been, um, we, meaning Andre and I, plus uh, uh, Jesse Fayon at, at, uh, uh, in NOS and Notre Dame have been doing a research uh, project aimed towards some of these issues of having a model that would uh, be coastal and include uh, in, include sea ice. Uh, we don't have a handle on the land pass ice, uh, as I was saying in the hallway yesterday, but uh, uh, but it does include sea ice. It includes tides, uh, coupled ice, ocean circulation, and wave uh, wave model, uh, wind wave model. Uh, so that's uh, uh, in research development, and I look more recent results have uh, uh, been very encouraging as to its uh, past operational implementation. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. I think there's more of a comment since we're talking about ICE, I mean, maybe to, towards Stan, is that to just remember when we're thinking about ICE that it's not just, I mean, it's really, really critical in Alaska, but it's not just Alaska, it's not just the Great Lakes. Uh, if you were going through the Cape Cod Canal last year, you were dealing with ice. Uh, if you were going into Portland Harbor, you were, you were dealing with ice. The cruise ship that I mentioned yesterday that's going to go up and over basically will be coming down through OPC's high seas waters in the Labrador Sea. They will be dealing with ice. Um, and uh, So it, it, it's a broader uh, perspective, but it doesn't mean that it's not important. It's a different scale. I think our scale, you know, what w w we're doing would be more, you know, a global or, or regional scale, not necessarily the high resolution of, the, say, the HER. But when you start thinking about uh, New York Harbor, Long Island Sound, uh, Chesapeake Bay, uh, we're down into a pretty small scale. Thanks, Joe, for that good comment. Okay, an excellent session. Thanks for all the speakers and the good questions. And we have yeah, stay here for just a moment. Um, we'll start again at uh, we're pretty much on time. We'll start again at 10:40. Um, but as I said uh, this morning. A show of hands of people that will go to Franklin's that did not sign up when you registered. 